All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, welcome one and all to Bison Table Talk, a discussion forum on issues of interest and concern. I'm Len Sambrowski, Associate Professor, Management Chair and Director of the MBA program at Nichols College. And I'll serve as the moderator for today's Table Talk, Education in a Time of COVID-19. Allow me to introduce our panel of subject matter experts. Mr. Jason Bitgood, Principal of East Lyme Middle School in the East Lyme, Connecticut. Jason has served in the education field for more than 24 years. In 2018, Mr. Bitgood was honored as the Outstanding Middle School Principal of the Year by the Connecticut Association of Schools. Welcome, Mr. Bitgood. Mr. Chris Sanford, Head of School of Woodstock Academy. Mr. Sanford has held this position since December 2013. Prior to Woodstock Academy, Chris served as the principal of Wheeler High School in North Stonington, Connecticut, and assistant principal and faculty member at East Lyme High School. Mr. Sanford, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Finally, Mr. Bill Boffey, Vice President of Enrollment at Nichols College. He's been a driving force of positive change on, on, change on the hills of Dudley, Massachusetts for more than nine years. Mr. Boffey, works passionately each day to inspire students towards success. Mr. Boffey, I appreciate your willingness to help launch our first Bison Table Talk. Happy to be here, Len, thank you. Gentlemen, let's get started. In 20, uh, 2007, Nassim Tlaib wrote The Black Swan, a book that focused on the extreme impact of unpredictable events. The central idea was to find ways to build robustness in the face of negative situations while exploiting positive conditions. With that as our intellectual backdrop, I'm interested how each of you first learned of our current black swan event, COVID-19, and the first step you took as a leader to build a robust action plan. Mr. Bitgood, let's start with you. Sure. Well, uh, Len, thanks for having me. And Chris, nice to see you again. Bill, nice to, nice to meet you. And I'm happy to be part of this presentation today. So yeah, I'm, I'm a principal of a, a large middle school here in East Lyme, Connecticut. We have about 135 staff members and we've got about 800 students. And, you know, first and foremost for us is always the safety and well-being of our students and of our faculty. So, you know, we were kind of watching this kind of spread across the country and, and making some arrangements ahead of time to see what that might look like. Um, we knew that we were going to move to a distance learning model. And so I think the first thing for us was to really take an inventory of what we had in place and what we could sustain with that model and um, whatever kind of gaps we had in that model to, to support that. Um, so I know a lot of districts, the initial reaction was to let's jump right in and let's do some live lessons. And we thought about that and we just kind of took some pause and we wanted to be thoughtful and, um, you know, didn't really want to be reactional with this and didn't want to be driven by emotion. And so we did take that time and we were maybe a little bit behind some, some other folks in the process, but we knew that each family had its own, um, you know, trials and struggles with this. And, and we've got healthcare workers that are parents here in the district. And so the support we had at home ranged from folks being at home to nobody being at home. Our youngsters range from 10 to 14 years old. So their level of independence is emerging. Um, and so we took a, a look at that. We surveyed our parents. We tried to figure out what, um, what we needed to do to make sure that this experience was equitable for all our students. Some kids didn't have laptops, so we were able to do a, a drive up, pick up laptop, pick up a hotspot if you needed it. Our principal, our, our superintendent, excuse me, was instrumental in doing a daily Q&A, four o'clock every single day. He would do, based on the emails that he received, the feedback from us, he would do a question and answer um, session. He'd send it out to everyone, and that was really helpful. I've actually followed that process here as well in my school to, uh, to just try to communicate, and I think that for us, initially, we over communicated. We were sending parents um, emails, messages, videos, on and on and on. And we had to kind of peel that back a little bit and we had to slow down with that. But I think we'd rather be criticized for over communicating rather than under communicating. So, as that process, that sort of turned into an evolution where, based on the feedback, we've been able to monitor, we adjust, and we move forward. Um, 
Again, I think that um, we've been able to give folks choice in this process, and we've been able to really be sensitive to the needs of all of our families out there and all of our kids. So we put a very robust plan in, in place. I'll, I'll probably get into that a little bit a little bit later on, I'm sure, in the conversation. And so I, I think our big takeaways for it were to, again, not react too quickly to really gather as much information as we could from the start to really listen to our community to our uh, students to our faculty see what's working well what's not working well and just um and take the time to uh to make sure that we have all the resources in in place so you know all in all we've been very very happy with our reaction to it and um terribly terribly impressed with uh, um you, you know just Every, how it's gone, our faculty has been tremendous, our families have been tremendous, and the support through our central office has been uh, has been terrific. So, Mr. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sanford, what about the Woodstock Academy? How did you approach it? Uh, some similarities and some differences uh, to what Jason did. I do want to thank you, Len, for having me on. Uh, the Academy is unique in, in the fact that it's an independent school in Connecticut. So it has a combination of private and public uh, components. So we have about, uh, I'm gonna just average the numbers, about 900 to 950 of public school students. And then we have a bunch of boarding students. We actually own um, a separate campus and we house 150 boarding students. So from the Academy's perspective, uh, because of our makeup of having that international piece, we are constantly looking at what's going on around the world. Um, and, you know, in full disclosure, Len is on the Board of Trustees, and we started having this conversation in January. We started notifying the board that something looked like it was happening. Uh, we kept hearing from our parents and our students that who are from China on our campus. Um, and we started the conversation before Christmas break about whether or not students were able to leave, uh, which fell in line with a lot of colleges were having similar conversations. Do you send your international students home and then could they come back? Uh, the Academy made a strategic decision about seven years ago to move to a one-to-one -one environment. So all of our students learn through or have the access to technology in terms of an iPad. We already know who doesn't have internet and who does at home uh, because most of our learning does happen that way. So all that data we already had because of the, our learning environment the way it was. Um, and if you pick the day, we really pulled the trigger on March 13th. So Friday, March 13th. Now I can get in great detail if you want uh, nuances, but Thursday afternoon on the 12th, we were sitting in my office and there was a call that the governor had and the commissioner of education had. Um, I was sitting there with my leadership team and um, we said, uh, because of the safety of our students, which are the number one priority, we were gonna pull the trigger. And Thursday, we had a faculty meeting at the end of the school day and said, this is it. Uh, this is our last day of school. We're transitioning to e-learning. And that's the term we use. We use transitioning to e-learning. Uh, we didn't use the word closing the school or um, we just used the word transitioning. Uh, and like Jason, we made some modifications. So we started collecting data. We did surveys every other Friday for the first two months. Uh, we collected data from parents, students, and the faculty. And we made some changes, such as when we initially transitioned, we made the day half day, and it was Monday through Friday. Through that survey data, it was realized that uh, students needed some extra, some of our students needed extra support, especially students that may be special ed or just struggling. Um, and the funny part is some of our parents needed support. Like, how do you help my kid in math? They, you know, think about them, how they teach math today is much different when they, when they learned. So Friday we transitioned uh, to make it a, like a, an appointment day. So there's actually real learning one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction through the iPad Monday through Thursday and Friday. Teachers are available for individual appointments for extra help, tutoring, whether you're a parent or a student, you can get extra help on that Friday. Uh, that's just one change and a lot we made a lot of other changes along the way uh, based on the feedback uh, from the survey we collect survey every, uh, we looked at the attendance every day we still do we have over 90 percent of our students logging on and taking the classes each day uh, which we're really proud of uh, just like jason mentioned and i'm sure you're going to hear from, from bill in terms of the, the uh, in terms of what happens at Nichols. the staff has really stepped up the faculty has really stepped up and our students have stepped up um, uh, it has been amazing to watch some of the things that are happening with our students and what they're doing. Um, and again, the, the support from the faculty has been unbelievable. Um, I think that's really all at the, at the beginning, Len, and I don't want to mention at least on the first question. I have other things I'll dive into, but I think that's what that's really what the transition happened. And now the conversation is, are we going back in the fall? We're having the same conversations now that we had in my office in March. 
Um, Mr. Sanford, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's a great uh, introduction to your first steps. How about Bill? How about at the college level? Uh, thanks, Len. Um, so, so, so much of what Kristen and Jason said is familiar to me. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's a tragic set of events, uh, but it's from a historical perspective, it's also really fascinating how how it evolved and it went from being not on uh, not on my radar, not on our radar to sort of a minor concern to an all encompassing uh, uh, circumstance that we had to that we had to deal with very, very quickly. Um, you know, I, I was at the uh, National Association of Independent Colleges and University annual meeting in the first week in February uh, in Washington, D.C. And there were, I don't remember any mention of this as a, as a imminent threat or as the, the most significant threat to any of our institutions. Uh, and on a personal level, I, I was sick as soon as I got back from D.C. Um, and I was watching TV and there was some talk of the coronavirus. And so I called my doctor and went in, no mention of it. The symptoms were very much like the coronavirus, it seemed to me, but he didn't mention it. So I didn't mention it. And, uh, and we, we kind of went from there, but you know, then it, then it was on the radar as a minor a thing that we may have to deal with until the end of February, when we got a notice, uh, a travel advisory uh, regarding our students that were uh, studying abroad, especially in Italy. And that same week, I know it was the lead story in the Chronicle. And so uh, it started to accelerate that, that, that first week in March, though, we were still planning events on campus, um, but, but we were, we were uh, very focused on how do we react to this imminent uh, crisis. Uh, uh, you and I traveled to New York City that weekend to an NCAA tournament game, uh, and it was, uh, it was all around us and certainly on, on our mind, but we were still holding tight to uh, what, what we uh, what we held dear about the, about the college experience and that really all changed the next week and, and it, it became uh, our president's council was meeting every single day about it uh, and trying to uh, come up with a, a plan for how to move forward uh, I, I put out a call to our enrollment team to create uh, virtual engagement with our uh, prospective students uh, and and that's really what what our as as Chris said so well our community uh, like his did our community really came together to uh, to make uh, adjustments and adapt to the new environment. Uh, so we we broke for spring break on Friday March thirteenth uh, uh, and and when they got back when the students got back from spring break classes were online and the faculty the faculty had ad adapted uh, to that and by that time. We had already created 40 uh, live virtual sessions for prospective students. Uh, we, uh, uh, we created classes for high school students to take uh, as a way to engage them and, and uh, uh, get them ready for making the decision about coming to Nichols. And so, so that's how it evolved uh, in my world and at Nichols and, uh, and continues to evolve even to this very moment. Thank you, Mr. Boffy. I appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's ask the question, what's the biggest challenge? Uh, we've been at this now for two months, Mr. Sanford, uh, two months at it. Uh, what's the biggest challenge at the, at the Academy in, in Woodstock, Connecticut? I think there are several. So I just jotting notes uh, is really, I put them in four big buckets. I think the first big challenge that we're facing, and I would imagine it's similar in every school, is the mental health challenges of our students and families. Uh, that's been a big issue at the academy, just like in every independent school or public school, whatever term you want to use, even at the college level, um, and not having access to those students who, who rely on the, the mental health structure, public health structure of a school. Um, so that has been a challenge for us to continue to try to engage those students and families. Um, and this time they might need it more than normal because of you know, layoffs or sickness or death in their own family. So that's been the biggest struggle for us. Uh, the other um, big struggle because of the independent nature of the school, similar to what uh, Bill was just talking about, the issue of enrollment. What does enrollment look like for, the, for us? It was the second semester. Do we take new kids in uh, in January? And on the, on the flip side, what does enrollment look like in September or I should say in August when students are supposed to arrive on campus? And then all the activities that we have planned, you have homecoming, you have 
just typical graduation and athletic contest and all those things that are part of the high school experience um, and the alumni experience um, that just go missing. And that connectiveness uh, that we pride ourselves on that most schools do um, has been a challenge. On the flip side though, I think it's also long run a positive because I think people are realizing, not that um, I think people didn't know it before, but I think it's highlighting the important role schools play in the community. Um, whether it be especially mental health now or feeding students, which is a big issue. And we, you know, schools are across the country, especially in, in at least in Connecticut are still feeding families, um, uh, you know, and, and the issue of just how important a basketball game is or whatever the athletic contest is to bring people together. Uh, so those are the big, the biggest challenge is mental health. And, and I don't have an answer. We don't have an answer. And we keep running all over the place to try to, how do, how do we develop programs to support those students who need that support? Um, and that we know need it. Um, and, and that's been, and that's an ongoing struggle that we face. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate this. Bill, uh, I'd like you to address that issue. And uh, has, has Nichols done anything uh, towards the, the mental health uh, aspect of, of this challenge? Sure. I, I uh, agree with Chris that that is the biggest challenge um, is, is the well-being of our students, of our staff and faculty, and uh, and that there's an additional challenge of monitoring that when you're remote, and so that's uh, I would say that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, for me, the biggest impact is is uh, that the rapid changes tend to leave some students behind. You know, there's there's a greater reliance on on technology, on devices, on internet connection, on workspace, uh, and that uh, can serve to exacerbate some disparities that, are, that already exist, whether it be based on income or, or uh, students' learning styles. Um, th those really um, get highlighted in, in an even greater way in a new, in, when there's rapid change or in this new remote environment, both of those things. Uh, so that's I think that's the biggest challenge we face uh, and, and mental health is certainly part of that rapid change and, and, uh, and dealing with that. Um, so me personally, um, I would say not being on campus is a, is a struggle. Uh, being, uh, working on a campus is the best part of working in higher education. The people you encounter, uh, the committed people you, deal, you work with every day, the students of all different sorts that you, you interact with. A lot of times it's by happenstance. Uh, who's walking by to go to financial aid, who's in the dining hall, who's at athletic events. And, and uh, that connection is, different, is just different in a remote environment. Um, fortunately, I think we'll have a chance to bring that back. We will have a chance to bring that back, but it's going to be a little bit different when we do. It's going to look a little bit different. It's going to take uh, some adjusting. Um, and I, I think back to what Jason said right at the beginning about um, overreacting and over communicating. That was certainly a challenge for us as well. As soon as we went uh, to the uh, remote working environment, I had a crazy set of expectations that I placed on the people that I work with uh, about how often we'll communicate and meet and, and send emails and, and, uh, and it was unrealistic and, and counterproductive. But it, but it took some time to, to, to adjust and, and figure it out. And, and we've gotten better at that. And I think we get better every day at engaging students as well. But um, uh, which I think Chris made a great point. That'll help us going forward as well. You, you, you learn new things, your toolbox gets a little bigger and stronger. And so even when you go back to um, uh, a format that's more familiar, you're, you're a little better prepared and, and, uh, and have more to offer as a result. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. I know, I know that uh, you know, on a personal level, I've been very impressed. And we've been at it two months and, and just the speed of ramp up and solving problems, uh, both uh, uh, you know what I've seen at Nichols College and, and my association with Woodstock Academy, it's just stunning. I mean, you know, hats off to everybody involved in the process. Jason, how about how about your your biggest uh, a problem challenge right now uh, from from the middle school? Familiar with middle school for most folks, it's been a long time since you've been in a middle school, and a middle school is a, is a pretty you know, kids go through more changes through the middle school experience um, than probably at any other time in their life. And so our kids thrive on being with each other. They thrive on, on going up to our media center and walking down the hall together. They thrive at recess time and in the lunchroom. And we've taken all that away. 
um, and it's hard to explain that to them. So I think that, um, you know, the social and emotional well-being certainly of our kids, we've got a great um, counseling staff and a social emotional team that really sprung right into action. We do a weekly newsletter. We do um, Google Meet, you know, live Zoom sessions for our kids that need that daily touch in. And then we've taken, um, we've put a lot of effort into kind of monitoring the kids that are not engaged in any of our lessons. So we probably, pretty similar to what Chris said, Chris, I think he used 90% as your engagement rate and we're there, but you know, for us, 800 kids, that means we've got 80 kids that, that are not engaged um, at all. And that's not good enough for us, certainly, even one child who's not engaged. So we spent a lot of time reaching out using our social worker, our school psychologist to get in touch with those kids um, to try to engage them. A lot of times it comes back to the family. I know that at a central office meeting yesterday, um, all the administrators were saying, you know what, we've, we've done more, um, we've acted more as a school psychologist or just a general psychologist for folks than we have as, you know, academic and instructional and curriculum leaders, because we've had to talk a lot of people through um, personal problems, medical problems, COVID's reached out and, it, and it's really connected to a lot of people in our community, either by knowing someone or a direct impact and that all has implications in teaching and learning. So that's been a struggle for us to deal with that. Um, so that's been our biggest challenge. Jason, thank you. Uh, and what are you, what are you personally doing to keep yourself mentally healthy and, and sane during this this whole process? I know you work work long hours. Uh, what are you, what are you doing? For for me, well, you know, I tried the the work from home thing for probably up until a week and a half ago, and I got to the point where I just I needed to to kind of. Um, get back into that routine. So I've been talked to the boss and I've been coming in on a regular basis here in school and just small things like taking pictures of what's going on in the building. Our custodial staff is doing a great job cleaning the building. We're bagging and tagging items from 1600 lockers. We have classroom lockers and um, PE lockers and we put all that in bags for a collection. But I send those pictures out to our faculty to keep them connected to our building, to keep them connected to what's going on. So although I'm not doing a lot in my personal life, it's helped me emotionally to be back in the building and just connect with a few people. We're having teachers come back in next week to clean out their rooms for the rest of the year. And so I'll touch base with them. And so I think for all of us, we're so used to that personal interaction and being next to one another that we've got to find ways around that and we've got to find ways to stay connected. So that's kind of given me a new skip in my step to come back into to work and, and work out of a normal schedule. And uh, and I like my house a little bit more now. It was turning into the family office and that's just not a good thing to do at home. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Bill, how about you? How are you keeping yourself sane? That can be a struggle, uh, Len, uh, I would say. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks, there, you had to let go of a lot of things that that uh, serve that purpose of keeping you sane and mentally strong. Like for me, that's playing basketball multiple times a week, and that stopped very abruptly. Uh, and so, uh, I spent a couple of weeks being miserable and not exercising at all. And I've gotten back to exercise uh, a little bit with, uh, including my uh, youngest son, uh, which is which has been great. So I, I appreciate what Jason said too. Staying connected with people is so critical. You know, we always try, I always try to uh, stay in contact with people who matter to me, but but even more so now um, via text or or uh, with my my two older children who don't live at home anymore, talking to them uh, regularly on the phone. I, I feel like uh, that's been critical. Um, a lot, you know, th there are fewer boundaries with work when you're working from home. I, you know, I find myself working pretty late at night and and on weekends and. Uh, and so finding that balance is, is a little bit of a struggle, but um, but that's just part of the adjustment, I think. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Uh, hey, Chris, uh, how are you keeping yourself sane? You, you keep in a routine or, or you modified uh, your routine? Definitely modified, uh, but that's the key, at least for me, was trying to maintain a routine. Uh, I mean, this sound, might sound silly, but making sure when I get up, I shower first thing in the morning, making sure that those things that you normally used to do um, that you continue to do. Now the showering has pushed off more to like 10. It used to be when I first got up, but it still happens uh, in the morning. Uh, you know what I, for me personally, um, which I think, uh, and I've talked to some staff members at the academy um, and some people that don't even aren't in education that are just not working. It's like you forget sometimes that your life revolves around your work and you 
become defined by that. I know the role that I have as the head of school, um, there's a lot of components to it. Um, it's, it's a complex uh, in terms of like just being everywhere and being visible in all these places. And you realize there is no athletic events that to go to at night. So by three o'clock in the afternoon, your job basically is done in terms of the human contact for school. There is emails to answer and texting, but those pieces that you usually in, or a big part of your day aren't there. So at least for us, for at least for me anyways, it is making sure that the routine stays. Uh, I'm spending more time like learning, learning new recipes. So I try to cook twice a week and like figure, just randomly pick a recipe and, and cook, um, uh, you know, and trying to, I guess I'm figuring out what it's like to be retired. Uh, I guess that's, as my parents say, that's really what I'm doing, except you can't go out of your house and do other things. Uh, but it just, uh, it, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I mean, it stinks and I want to get back and I'm pushing hard for us to come back in the fall because those, just like those kids miss those things that are important to them in the educational process. They're just as important to us. We didn't, we left, we, we decided to work in education for a reason. Um, and all those pieces that, that are happening or not happening now are the reasons why we're in education. And that's really crucial for everyone's sanity. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, trying to get back to the norm and, and trying to get back with that interaction with people. So let's talk about that road ahead. And we're going to start with Mr. Boffey. Um, what is that road ahead for us uh, on the college level? And then uh, we'll go with Jason and uh, Chris. You can bring us home on this. Yeah, Len, I, I would say uh, we've already started on the road ahead. Uh, we started on the road to healing, if you will. Uh, we're we're going to we're, we're going to offer a limited number of tours to some of our accepted students who haven't made a decision yet, starting next week. And so that's that's going to be a little bit of a return to normalcy. On a broader scale and on an institutional level, we've got uh, five task teams working on uh, what what the new uh, new normal. I know that's an overused uh, phrase, but what that's going to be like, and we're challenged with coming up with a plan in the next month or two, even though there's still tremendous uncertainty. But if we We'll, we'll need to come up with a plan so we can communicate with students, both new students and returning students, about what that's going to look like and what they can expect. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's the challenge we face now. Uh, you know, we talk we talk about the Nichols way, which uh, for for us means um, finding out what's unique about every individual student and using that as as the basis for. Uh, uh, for all the touch points in their educational and career journey. And so now we're talking about the Nichols way forward, uh, how, we, how we engage with students uh, and, and use their uh, interests, their assets as part of the uh, building what, what's in front of us, building the new normal. So we're looking forward to that. I, I think, um, you know, we've said it a couple of times that out of crisis, you're, you're forced to do new things and those new things make you stronger. And so I, I think that's really true. Uh, and, and, you know, at, the way we respond to this defines who we are in the next, in the next stage. And I think this, the institutions that respond well to it will be set up to, to do well in the future and the institutions that struggle with it will, will struggle with it going forward. What, what's that old saying that iron sharpens iron and I, and I do feel like as a community as a as an institution we're getting sharper because we're we're, we're responding together and we're we're uh, we're facing the challenges head on thanks bill appreciate it jay jason how about you so i think that you know a favorite quote for me is is that um yesterday's history today is a gift and, and tomorrow's a mystery so i don't know what's going to happen in the fall you know as, as chris said I want to get back um, and I know our kids need to get back. And so we're working on that. So, you know, I, I look at the things I'm trying to take away the positives of this to kind of look forward in. So we know that we can react now and we can sort of come to market more quickly than we've ever imagined that we that we can. We're using tools like this, like Zoom and Google Meets and whatnot to kind of bring a whole new level of collaboration. It's been interesting for us that although we've lacked in that social interaction and kind of bringing you know, physically people together, our level of collaboration among the faculty is higher than it's ever been because they've got to find answers to questions quickly. And they've got to, you know, they've got to implement things that they've never done. We probably had 30% of our faculty that wasn't really um, Google Classroom users, and they had about two weeks to figure it out. 
that normally would have taken six months in a public school setting. We would have had to have a committee and we would have had to come together and it would have been expensive. And they just figured it out because we were forced to do it. And the same thing with, with other pieces of technology. So I think that we've also, it's given us an opportunity to just pause again and reflect on the quality of work that we put in front of kids and the quantity of work that we put in front of kids and think about what we're trying to measure and so those are going to be great takeaways to kind of push the conversation forward when we come back in the fall to say, um, you know, how, how can we be more efficient with this? And so, you know, at the end of the day, I'm a big user of technology. I love it, and this has actually pushed us. Um, our board's been supportive. We're going to have one to one devices for everyone starting in the fall, but we can never take away those great teachers. We don't want to um, get to a spot where we rely solely on technology to do the job. As Chris eloquently said, we all entered this profession because we wanted to be teachers and teachers teaching doesn't mean just using technology. So I'm excited about the opportunities in the fall and kind of these takeaways that we have and, uh, and learn from, from everything that's gone well, because a lot has really gone well. So we're trying to stay focused on the positives. So um, thanks, we'll Mr. Bitgood. Thanks, uh, Mr. Sanford, the road ahead. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there was a big movement in education um, a, a couple of years ago and actually has maintained it's the, you know, you want to, you no longer walking in your classroom and shutting the door and teaching and, and keeping everyone else out. And I think this process, at least for us, and I think it's happened in a lot of places that are using technology to teach, those doors of the classrooms are, are been thrown open. Uh, I've seen, you know, I bop into classrooms all the time, like walking through campus, you just zoom right in and zoom right out. We have parents that are joining. Uh, cause you know, their child, there's like, bring the, bring your parent to work day, bring your parent to school day was one of the things, bring your pet to school day, all those little, I don't want to use the word gimmick. That'd be the wrong term, but all those things that you can do to engage that student in that family has, has, has changed the dynamic, um, of what the classroom can be. And Jason brought up a point, you know, we're talking as administration, especially since we collected that data on those Fridays, like I talked about the survey, less is more. You know, in education, it's like you don't throw anything out. You just keep adding. You know, you keep adding, adding another unit, add another project, add another 48 page paper that no one's going to read. So but less is more. There's a way that you can actually change the dynamic and do less work and kids learn more. Right. We all know that. Uh, but, you know, and, and that's a hard sell until you're forced to do it. And I think teachers have been forced uh, and not as not forced in a negative way, but through this process, forced to do it. And I'm hoping on a larger scale. Uh, more so for the uh, the public world than the private world, but I think it uh, connects to both, that policymakers in education realize they need to change. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, right now, I would think moving forward in Connecticut, at least, there is no need to have snow days anymore. Instead of canceling school, you can just say tomorrow's an e-learning day and you are now working on Monday and Tuesday at home and and, and you set a graduation date and it doesn't move. Well, in Connecticut, that's illegal. You can't have a snow day. So there has to be a law or regulation needs to be changed in Hartford uh, for that to happen. And that's just one example. And I'm, you know, Jason, I'm sure you're having a lot of the same conversations. And so those policymakers, if they have the ability to shift and learn like we have um, in our state organizations that a lot of us are members of, it is an exciting time. Because you can set it, I mean, graduation at a high school is a huge deal. And you can set that graduation date and never move it because there's no more snow. Uh, but again, that we can't make that decision alone. So the positive is hoping to get some changes at the state level or national level of those things that, 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 are, own, that are put on top of us that are quite difficult and sometimes to meet. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm extremely confident in you three as leaders. Uh, I hope the leaders above you, <laughs> you know, heed some of your suggestions, uh, fantastic. All right. Um, well, we've, um, we've gone uh, full circle here on uh, what we wanted to get out. I, I've got some questions from the chat room. And, and again, for those people that are listening on Zoom, if you have a chat uh, question, please go ahead and put that in our chat box. But I'll, I'll raise this. Is this, this is for anyone. Um, let's go back to the, you, you, some of you have talked about it, the opportunities that have emerged, the positive aspects of this. Uh, if there's is, if there's any other opportunities that you see in our current situation, you'd like to uh, comment on. This is from Heather. Heather's asking about opportunities that have emerged from uh, COVID-19. Well, I can just speak quickly to that at the academy. Um, so we have a lot of different factors, I guess. You know, we have admissions and we have uh, the international recruitment and we have all those different 
uh, sectors. And as we meet and I'm meeting individually with everyone and we're talking about the changes, there is exciting things that are out there. I'll give you one example in terms of admissions for us. You know, why can't we have all of our classes online or a portion of them and homeschoolers be able to take a class? You know, homeschoolers now, um, uh, if we have a high level advanced placement history class or math class, why can't a student join? Why can't a student who's sitting in an eighth grade class at Woodstock Middle School or Pomfret or it doesn't matter any of our sending towns and they say, you know, they're not being challenged in their eighth grade classroom. Why can't they zoom into a high school class? So those are the things that we're looking on the educational side. There's a lot of other examples, but those are just two uh, that I'll provide. So we're trying to leverage this and making it a positive. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I would say uh, blending formats is a great opportunity, you know, that it, you, you don't have to be 100% uh, on site or 100% online. There can be some combinations of that, which we, we've known, but we've really never uh, we've never been forced to do. And so now students have, have become a little more familiar with that and might have some greater uh, comfort level with that. So I think that that creates an opportunity uh, for us to figure out how, how do we best blend those uh, opportunities. Um, in, in enrollment, um, there's great opportunity in what we've learned from engaging students virtually that, that you know, we, we, can, we can connect with families over Zoom and travel less. Uh, and, and I think that's going to impact the way we do things going forward, which is a, which is a great opportunity. We can be more efficient in the way, in the way we uh, interact with people. Um, and, and the other opportunity is uh, to be responsive to family needs. Uh, it, this crisis isn't, isn't only for the institution or the students at the institution, it's for families everywhere. And so uh, we try to make uh, higher education more accessible for, for families and, and figuring out uh, different ways of doing that by, by listening and, and understanding what the financial challenges are. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Laura and Laura is asking, uh, she's interested and this could be for anyone, what feedback have you received from the students, um, uh, from the high school students, uh, middle school students or parents uh, on this uh, new way of teaching? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in, Jason here. So we've surveyed our students and the number one, overwhelmingly the number one um, feedback point that we've gotten from students is they miss the social interaction with their peers and want to come back to school uh, without a doubt. And second, they want to they want to be with their teachers and they want to be in their teachers in a classroom setting, not in a virtual setting. So those were our two big takeaways from the most recent student survey that we've sent out. Agree. We're hearing the same thing from our students that they want to come back to uh, what they knew and they want to be back on campus. Uh, with their friends, with their with their teachers, and that sort of thing. Um, specifically for the high school students who are taking our classes at Nichols, the feedback has been incredibly positive. Uh, in fact, uh, this was an idea; wasn't my idea. It, it was it came from the academic side. The, the idea was to um, uh, offer these classes because maybe students had some excess capacity with the online learning, and and maybe they'll want to take them. We had no idea if that was gonna be true or not. We, we said, how many is the right number? Maybe two or three. Well, we quickly filled three and we had a, a, a town hall forum with parents of prospective students and they, uh, the feedback was so positive about not only the experience in the classroom, but that we responded in that way with that offer, which they, uh, they didn't know of any other schools that were making that offer uh, to students. And so, uh, we went back to our academic folks and said, can we have a few more and start them in May? And, and we filled those and now we're going to start a few more in the first week of June. So, so that's become, uh, and that's something I can't see any reason why we wouldn't do that going forward for, for uh, high school students, for our admitted students or our deposited students or just any high school students. So that's, that's become a, a, great, uh, a great opportunity and the feedback's been entirely positive. So thank you for that question, Laura. Did you decide having me on camera was a bad idea, Len? Is that, was, that, was that feedback based? <laughs> that was not feedback based. Uh, and and uh, Mr. Sanford, do you have uh, any, how has been the reception from the uh, the parents and the students at Woodstock Academy about uh, e-learning? 
Yep. Uh, same thing. Definitely the, the social interaction is being missed uh, by everyone. And what we found is, uh, you know, the survey showed on the academic side that it was way too much homework. Um, so we made some modifications to what the homework looked like. Uh, less is more, that whole philosophy in terms of, uh, of what the, and making sure homework was more relevant. That was a conversation that spurred out of this, which has been excellent. Uh, for us, uh, being at the high school, the biggest complaints, and that's in quotes, is, gonna, is the loss of things that we can't control. You know, the prom was a huge loss for our seniors. That was a significant issue. Uh, what graduation is going to be looking like or look like uh, that, you know, that's dictated by the governor. And he sent all these edicts out of what we can and can't do. Uh, those are the uh, the major com complaints. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna putting it in, in, in quotes. The major complaints are around those types of events, which are totally social in nature uh, and the rite of passage for most high school or all high school seniors. Um, and rightfully so, I think it goes back to the kids just want to be able to talk to someone that's their friend. Uh, and, you know, the academy prides itself on building relationships. You know, similar to a college campus, you have kids from all over the place and they can build one community. Uh, and that's the academy having six sending towns and, you know, kids from 15 different countries and seven different states. And they, they miss that opportunity to, to meet someone. Um, and, you know, it's so do we as, as adults. Thanks. And we're getting ready to uh, wrap this up. Uh, if there's anyone that uh, is participating in Zoom, if you have a question, please feel free to chat that in. Uh, I want to personally thank uh, these three leaders in education for taking their time today and help us uh, launch this uh, Bison Table Talk. We're hoping to do this at least once a quarter from the hills of Dudley, Mass, where we talk about the interesting topics, uh, things that are on our mind. And uh, we wanna invite uh, leaders like this, subject matter experts that can share their wisdom. Um, I, I've seen in, in teaching um, online at Nichols College that it's a, it's a different uh, skill set. It's a, a, a different set of tools that you have to use and it is a challenge, but it's um, unique. It's, it's, it's certainly better to, to teach online than not uh, uh, offer the education. And uh, I, I view it as, uh, two-dimensional art versus three-dimensional art, that there are things that are missing, that, that human interaction and the nuance of the facial expression and the body language in class of a student that you know they're not interested because their head's on the desk. But when you're teaching online and you have a blank screen, you're not, not sure they're engaged or not. So it's two-dimensional versus three-dimensional art. But as uh, artists in education, all of us, uh, we, uh, we can adjust and, and modify. I'm gonna um, uh, please allow uh, each of you a, a, a closing statement or comment about yourself or the school or uh, good wishes to, to the uh, listeners out here. I'll start with Bill Boffy because I know he's always ready with a, with a quick, quick quip. Uh, quick is not anything anybody's ever accused me of, Len, but uh, thank you for that. You're always uh, way too generous. Uh, so I, I really like your metaphor of 2D art versus 3D art. And I, I would say that um, in, when you when you combine both, when you blend both online and in, in person, and and it's a, a fuller uh, educational experience, I think maybe that's a fourth dimension, and that and that to see that as a, a positive thing is what I'm is the way I'm choosing to look at it. There is a there is a question in the chat from Heather, which is such a great compassionate question about the students' disappointments, uh, and that's so true that that. Uh, especially for all students, but especially for seniors who had uh, the last part of their experience taken away. Um, that, that's a real challenge uh, to deal with. One of the ways we've responded is to offer those students a chance to, to come back and, and uh, work towards a graduate degree and live on campus. And uh, we're, we're trying to make the graduate degree more accessible financially uh, for those students so that they can, they can get the most out of it and have a second shot at a, at a, a year on the hill and, and in residence. So that's just one of the things we're doing, but, but that's such a great point uh, that, uh, that it's, it, it's some, in some ways you can't make up for some of what the students have lost. So thank you so much for including me in this, Len, and it's, it's a pleasure to, to be uh, with Chris and Jason here. Thank you. Jason, closing comments? Yeah, sure. I think that, um, you know, the, the whole process, I'm surrounded by just a lot of talented people. And all this is really um, in their hands and they're doing such a terrific job. Our teachers are the most dedicated and, you know, I'm just so proud of them and proud to work by their side every day. 
Um, I've got a great leadership team that, that I work with and they've been super supportive. I've got a superintendent that reaches out to me daily just for check-ins to see how I'm doing. And, and that really goes a long way and I'm appreciative of that. So I think, you know, this has been such a team effort through administration, through our teachers, through our families that um, I'm just, you know, proud to be part of the East Lyme community here and proud to work with the folks that I do. And again, just a shout out for our teachers. And, you know, the other side of this is our kids have risen to a challenge that um, it's just been extraordinary. And, you know, their willingness to want to be engaged, to want to reach out to their teachers and participate. And they're Zooming on their own with their friends to kind of work through assignments and whatnot. So, you know, it's been an eye-opening experience and it's sort of at a, at a spot where I'm in in my career. It's sort of um, rekindled my love for what I do. And, and that's been... Uh, you know, that's been terrific. So again, um, you know, Viking, Viking pride here goes a long way and, and happy to be part of the team in the community. And Len, I appreciate this, this chance to collaborate and talk about this. Chris, it was great to see you again, Bill. Nice to, nice to hear your thoughts as well. So thank you everyone for letting me participate. Thank you. And Chris, you'll have the last word here. I do want to also nice meeting you, Bill, and nice to see Jason again. I do uh, want to push back, though. I think my staff is better than Jason's staff. <laughs> Just want to say that. But to echo their comments, it is the it is the um, that that's been the most impressive to see the people stepping up, students, uh, faculty, parents uh, stepping up to help during this process. Um, you know, uh, we were talking yesterday as an administrative team, just to share a quick story instead of repeating everything, that we anticipate a huge increase of the number of kids that get involved with clubs and activities and sports uh, um, when we come back in the fall. So, uh, which is a positive, you know, we always struggle with trying to get kids involved, uh, the social piece, because that's, you know, all the research shows that, that it's not, you know, it's beyond the school day, that's just as important. Uh, and we hope and anticipate that, that that kids have missed that experience so much that we see more kids trying out for sports. We're adding sports teams, adding clubs. And so I, that, that's just an example of, you know, of what we've talked about today and, and, the, and the big impact we think it's going to have on our kids. And, you know, we're working our tails off to get back uh, in the fall. I mean, I, I cannot see doing this another uh, semester or another year. I, I don't think that it's going to be good. Um, for uh um for the kids and their families and 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 you know and and but again a lot of that's going to be dictated by other people not by us by the state and uh, other agencies around but thank you len again for having us on uh at one of these i hope one of these talks you do you can give a tour of your office talk about the pictures that are behind you and you know, the, the guitar maybe you can play the guitar for us <laughs> no i don't think we want that but uh, all right <laughs> again uh, thank you all thank you all for participating in this and i i know that that for me um, education has been such a powerful force in my life for change. It, 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 it just transitioned me from a totally different person. And so for all of you in education, I think if we continue to serve others, uh, we're going we're gonna to get through this and so we're going to get through this in the right way. So again, thanks, thanks for coming. I will see you uh, down the road and, and come visit us, Bison Pride, on the hill of uh, Dudley, Mass. Take care. Bye.